Hey, and welcome to another Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom Ray, and I have a great show this week. It is someone who I had met previously through another person that I had on the show, but uh, it was it was during the summer. Uh, he was painting a mural with uh, Triangulador, who I had talked to last season, and his name is Henrique, and they were doing a mural together on Monroe Street here in Madison, and one of the things that was on the mural was complex lettering like it said Madison in big letters and it was in a particular style and I'd stop by just to see the progress of the mural a few times but they were busy I didn't want to stand there the whole time and bug them because they were trying to finish it within like two weeks which I thought was crazy but they actually did it we talk about that on the podcast but uh, as well as going there I, I, I met Henrique and I wanted to know a little bit more about what he does. We spoke briefly, and he actually said he listens to the show, which is always fun. Love that. Not a requirement to be on the show, but it's always cool to hear. On this interview, I learned more about his background. He is a, uh, he's more into typography. He teaches that. He's also uh, into wood printing and printing in general. So I get to learn more about kind of, it's something I've been fascinated with, and we talk about it on the show, is during a time period when I worked at an ad agency, I was unaware of just fonts were a thing that you downloaded. You had, it's like, that's a cool font. But I never realized like the amount of work that people put into using them as a design, how far space they should be, how big they should be, the kerning in between it, all this stuff. I learned about it then and then started to get it, but I still, it's not, I can see it. I know it when I see it, but when I'm doing it, I have no clue where to start. And we get into just what about now with the web and things being digital, those fonts, they used to be on print. You could make them perfect. Now they're expanding. People can interact with them. People can make them larger and smaller. People can change the font. P it, websites don't keep the same content all the time. All this kind of fascinating stuff. And what does that mean for someone whose artistic background is working with fonts, working with ty typography? And it's a fascinating conversation. So uh, we get into all that kind of stuff. And uh, again, don't forget to go to TomRaysWebsite.com and help support the show by uh, just checking out my eBay page where I sell and collect pop culture toys and books and illustrations. Take a look. Just go see if there's anything that interests you. If not, I'm just asking you go there. But you could, there's a link on TomRaysWebsite.com. Anyway, that's enough of that. Here's my interview with Henrique right now on Tom Ray's Art Podcast. My name is Enrique Nardi. I am a graphic designer and professor at UW Medicine. I've been teaching at UW since 2016, mm. and I teach uh, basic graphic design at the art department, and recently I also started teach teaching publication design and uh, typeface design as well. Okay. How did you end up at the university? Um, I knocked on their door. I <laughs> mean, uh, a, a few months prior to that, I moved to Madison with my former wife, she came here to do a postdoc on uh, wood anatomy. And then while I was here, I joined her. And then a couple of months later, I started looking for opportunity to, to teach here. I, I used to teach in Brazil. Okay. And uh, so I, I reached out to UW. I spoke to the students. And then I offered like workshops and lectures. And then... Uh, little by little, I was like entering their world, and eventually, Professor Miller invited me to uh, start teaching there. I'm always interested by that's why I asked like how you ended up here because um, people who end up teaching here, it's it's fascinating to go like what brings them to this university. Like it's a it's one of the Big Ten, but at the same time, it's like when you think of like art schools. Well, I mean, it is there. There is actually a very good art program here at the school. It's just, it's interesting to hear what brings people here. First of all, I want to ask, what is wood anatomy? 
What? <laughs> <laughs> what the heck is that? Is that what you said? Wood anatomy? Yeah, wood anatomy. Yes, it's a it's a field of research in which people will identify different types of woods from around the world, and that can be oh. used for several things. For example, you can prevent illegal logging. Uh, of wood if you know the the types of wood that people are transporting for example oh wow okay yeah i was just when you said that i'm like did i hear that right so yeah and and medicine medicine has one of the largest uh, wood collections in the world at the forest products laboratory no kidding yeah i had no idea wow i didn't (laughs) i didn't know we'd and i also i also have another connection like my actual connection with wood uh, has to do with uh, another amazing place that we have here in Wisconsin, which is the Hamilton Wood Type Imprinting uh, Museum. That that is up in Two Rivers, Wisconsin. One of my favorite spots in the U.S. And I'm lucky to live so close to them. I go there every year. It's an amazing museum, and they host a conference called the Waste Goose every uh, first weekend of November. It's an amazing place. Oh, I've never heard of that. I'm gonna have to check that out. That sounds cool. And, and then when you, you said you had taught in uh, Brazil, so what were you teaching in Brazil? What was the background of your teaching in Brazil? Um, it, was, it was essentially uh, revolving around typography, which is my, my field of expertise. So in Brazil, I was teaching um, type history or typography for uh, publication design as well or for visual identities. And uh, shortly after I graduated in Brazil in graphic design, I started in an educational project called Typocracia. And it's a project that is now almost 18 years old. And the idea of the project is to promote typographical culture throughout Brazil by means of lectures, workshops, book donations, conferences, exhibitions. And, uh, and with, within that personal educational project, I got to travel to over half of Brazilian states since mm-hmm. 20, 2003. And, uh, and this is like the main thing that, that I did related to typography. And as a side uh, job, sort of saying, I was teaching at universities as well. You said you ended up doing graphic design at the UW and, uh, did, and then also the publication stuff. So is your graphic design mostly... Uh, I want to say f- font based, but it would be typographical. What's the better way to say it? Like, I know it, I don't, I don't want to be like saying the word where it's like, Oh, we hate that word or anything like that. Like, is it okay to just say fonts or is typographical? Like what's the. It's, it's fine to say both. Like you, you can talk about uh, fonts by using the word font or typeface or mm-hmm. typography. Typography will be like the, the main field, like we, we call it type uh, typography, the field. But uh, when we refer to the actual letters, we can use the term typeface if we're talking about a specific family of fonts, or we can use font if we are referring to something that is more specific to a particular style, or if we are referring to the font file, actually. Yeah. So we can either use typeface or font. It, it works both ways. It's, it's fascinated me, the... Uh... I had only learned about, I guess, I guess the the enthusiasm for typeface and fonts uh, when I started doing. I, I was a web developer at a, an ad agency here in town, and I would have to work directly with a lot of the graphic designers for stuff they wanted to do for ads and things like that. And yeah. normally, what I'm used to is just make it look the same, right? But then. When I started working for them, it was a lot of, uh, let's put it this way. One of the first conversations I had was with this really like fantastic graphic designer. And we would argue all the time about how the fonts looked on the websites. And Hmm. she said, basically, I was like, what? I put in the font that you gave me. You know, it was, I was able to apply the font that she wanted. And she said, but the kerning is off. And I was like, well, how, what? And she's like, basic rule you can always use other people's fonts but never use their original kerning and i was like i don't know what that means so then she <laughs> we sat down and she went over and i actually ended up learning a lot and about the difference of, of fonts and typography and kerning and all that and i never i never knew the difference of it and it's why is there such a huge fasc- fascination with with this type of particular thing (laughs) first let me tell you that i could definitely argue about that 
not using the authors, the author of the fonts kerning, but that would be like a completely different show. But no, like, yeah. but actually, no, that actually describes the point is like, I know that when she told me that that was her thought on the matter, but there's a school of thought, like it's split down the middle. Like nobody really agrees with the fonts. All they agree with is that like, it's, it needs to be correct. Like that's the only thing anybody will agree on, but what that version of correct is, nobody agrees on. <laughs> what is the fascination with that font sort of thing? Wow. Uh, <laughs> well, in in my life, it it started because um, my my dad owned a print shop, so I grew okay. up in a print shop environment, mm-hmm. like surrounded by stacks of paper and uh, litter set and light tables so like i w- i grew up like playing with those rubber uh sheets of of letters so like i think this is how i i became interested on the subject um uh, and and it's it's been growing like in in like in the world especially because of the of desktop publishing and home computers people got access to softwares that allowed them to make typefaces and to play with with fonts like if you look like these days common people get to choose fonts from drop down menus on word processing yeah. software so it's like everybody at one point is like oh i, I might eventually need to choose between um, helvetica georgia or comic sans so it's like this this made typography more of a popular subject in the the recent years than before one of the things i've noticed is free fonts based or uh, as opposed to paid and created fonts, which can get very pricey. Like there seems to be this weird market where fonts can cost like hundreds of dollars. Yes. And it's not that weird. Like, especially if you're, if you're licensing fonts for products, if you're licensing fonts to be on commercials or 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 products, uh, it, it can it can be like extremely uh, profitable market mm-hmm. as well. But at the same time, the tools are making it easy for people to have custom typefaces instead of licensing traditional fonts for a long time. There is a a, a pretty uh, popular case of um, IBM. IBM announced in a, in a few years ago that they were starting to use a custom version, like a custom typeface, in all their um, company and uh, and they were using IBM Plex and this is a type family that's been growing and and by the time they announced they were adopting IBM Plex sense they also mentioned that they were they stopped licensing Helvetica for all the computers in the company and really? that was like uh, I think it was like a million dollars a year that they were paying monetized and they stopped with that bill just by investing on their own custom typeface. Huh. And now it's and that is a free font. Like you can use IBM Plex uh, for any job. Like it's, it's a free font, but it, it has quality. So the thing about the free fonts versus paid fonts is not much if a typeface is free or not, but it's more like uh, who is the author of that typeface? Does it come from a professional type designer? If it comes from a professional type designer or type foundry, you you pretty much can rely on the quality of that typeface. But if it's from an unknown source or if it's an amateur typeface, it doesn't matter if it's free or if it's for sale at Etsy or a market, etc. Like you gotta have like extra care with a lot of technical details when it comes to spacing. Uh, the the quality of the glyphs if it has a special character so many things so it's like it's more a matter of who is the provider of that typeface not much if it's free or paid okay actually makes a lot of sense and also is the IBM typeface did they just redesign it new like creating their own version or did they kind of create one where it's like we're going to do a Helvetica pay, uh, based version no. okay luckily they they created one from scratch and okay. it's uh, it is inspired by the the logo the IBM logo and uh it is way more uh, contemporary than, than really? Helvetica it's way yes yes and and it's been growing they've been de- they developed like a a sans serif version there's a monospace like the, it's it's growing and it's a, a really beautiful uh, typeface. Huh. I will say one thing that I've noticed over the years as a person who has not one, but two things that I have to create fonts for my band and this podcast where I have to use an apostrophe. 
Oh, I yeah. always am very, I'll be like, Ooh, I love that font. Like when I'm trying to redo some stuff and then I'll go to type it and the apostrophe always phoned in. It'll be just like, bloop, there's, here's an apostrophe. Like it's never, or it's spaced weird. Like I find that I will run into people will like the, the apostrophe is like a, a an afterthought on some of these. Yeah. Or, so sorry, that's and just venting. He's such, such a creative character. People can yeah. put a lot of uh, like expressiveness on that character because it's not so essential for the, the whole communication, let's say of a book, mm -hmm. but uh, still some people overlook that. Yeah. And so that's just a frustration I have. It's like, it's like a little pet peeve. Yeah. It's like, so the first thing I do now is I'll just type in an apostrophe and, and then uh, kind of scroll through fonts and see like what it does. And then I'll type something like if it has a good one. I, I have that with the ampersand. I find it so beautiful, and I, I think it's a good measure of how expressive or creative the typeface is. How they design the ampersand of the of the font. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. We both have we both have our own one that we like to use. And uh, so I wanted to bring up too. One of the other reasons I wanted to talk to you was because. Um, I met you while you were working on a mural, but uh, you you were working with a, a Triangulador, who I'd had on the show previously. He invited me yeah. over to look at the the mural that's being painted over by the old uh, the old uh, Monroe Street Art Center, and I got to meet you there. But you guys were working, and we were in a car, and you know the, you couldn't really stand around and talk to people the way the world is today. So I really wanted to get a chance to talk to you. So first of all, I just wanted to say I'm so glad that you're here. And then also, um, now I can actually talk to you about the project that you were working on. So how did this mural get started? Well, uh, it started with uh, Liu's invitation. He had that uh, arranged with uh, Liz Lauer already, and uh, he was looking for a partner to help him out with the mural. And uh, we started talking um, like different ideas for, for the mural. And, uh, and then we partnered up to, to do the mural. How did, so, how did you and him meet, first of all? Uh, he reached out to me. Like he was, I, I think he saw some of my stuff on online. And then he invited me to uh, check out his uh, studio apartment. And then I went there one day, social distancing, mask and stuff. But like we started connecting and, and, and talking. We, we talked a lot, like hours, and, mm -hmm. and talking about our stories and what brought us to Madison and, uh, and, and comparing like uh, styles and, and talking about collaboration from the beginning, even before talking about the actual mural. And then eventually he, he, he mentioned the mural and asked me if I was up to, and I was like, yes, definitely. I would love to collab on that. Yeah. And how did you guys come up with the design that you ended up using on the wall? Um, Lyubov already wanted to do a mural that would uh, show his um, uh, pattern style that he's been uh, throwing around at the mattresses and his uh, paintings. Like he has a, a pretty consistent um, pattern style and he wanted to do a mural like showing that as well. But he wanted also to have something of a message, like a lettering uh, within that mural. And this is my, my expertise. So I was like, let's try to come up with a message and something in there. At first, we even consider having a mural that would uh, show the word Monroe because of Monroe Street, but then eventually we switched that to Madison. And he was like, okay, so we got this big word. Let's try to think of ways to, to represent that word in a, in a more interesting, unique way. And then I was looking for references on the uh, sign painting style that it's, it's quite popular on the, river, uh, on the boats in the Amazon region in Brazil. So it's like they, they have like a, a sign painting style, which is something that, that is extremely popular when you have boats and you sign paint the name of the owner, yeah. the family, et cetera. And this is something that became also popular in the Amazon region, but it somehow it is like it got twisted a little. So like some of the details and the way you would include uh, patterns inside the letters, for example, or the 3D or the gradient. These are all things that I was I was looking into, and it's uh, it, it become it became like something uh, something of a reference to to use on the on this project. And because I'm from Brazil, you is from Mexico, we wanted to make a mural that had uh, Latin America influences, and I was looking at the Amazon region as a reference. I wouldn't have guessed that. Well, of course I wouldn't. I don't. Ha I don't know the background of that, but now I do because you just told me. 
<laughs> so how long do you think it guys it took you guys total? I know I remember when I first stopped by and spoke with both of you, you were like, it's going to take a week. And I was like, a week? Come on. And then it almost kind of did. Like, did you end up doing it in under a week or was it, did it end up no, being two? It, it lasted two weeks. Two weeks. End. Okay. Yeah. We, we had some issues. Uh, I mean, but it were, they were minor issues. For example, we needed a way to uh, draw the letters on the wall. And we tried at first working with a projector at night. But oh, then right. because the wall was so big, we need to pull back a lot in order to have the, the letters projected on the wall. And it turned out that it got extremely pixelated in low res. And when we got close to the wall to trace it, we can barely see the edge <laughs> of the letters. So that night we was like, okay, so this is going to be a problem because we, 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 we were talking about having two projectors side by side lining up so that the projectors will be closer to the wall. But that would require finding a second projector. And we, all, we, we even got two projectors, but like one was quite old. So like it, it, it wouldn't work. It would, it would take a lot of time in there. So yeah. what I did the next day was I was like, let me try to find a way to trace the letters by counting the bricks. So I, it, was, it is a brick wall. So I use that as a grid. So I, I laid out the, the words on a photo of the wall with just the bricks. And then I print that out and I was like, okay, this brick is this brick. And I started to, to wing it in a way. And, and at, at least it worked because we didn't have to wait until the next night to, to, to try to figure out the projector thing again, and then we, we got things going. But at the same time, uh, in, in some situations, I had to move some of the ladders to fix the spacing a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, at times, like going for the details of the ladders, for example, we, we tried the outline of the ladder, and then the outline was starting to drip because we use a marker instead of the paint just for the test. Mm -hmm. And then we, we, could clean, we had to clean up that uh, tracing. And, and to play with the thickness in order for the thickness of the letters to be perceived from afar, we had to increase the thickness at one point. So th there, there were some trial and error things that uh, uh, that made us, uh, that had the project lasting longer than, than it should. Okay. It didn't last much longer. It still went no, pretty no, quick. And, like what and, you and said I, there, that should have taken weeks. <laughs> All yeah, those yeah. Troubles. Like two weeks, it was the, I mean, but also because Lyubov is really talented with the spray cans. Like he, right. he's super fast. And, and that gradient he made with the, yeah. with the special spray cans, that is really, really good. But like when you see him working with the spray, he has a lot of, like it, it's really sharp. He's worked with the spray and fast as well. So I was like, I was staying behind with the details of the letter. And he was like, you know what I'm doing here? a flag of Madison. I'm doing a, a flag on, on the rooftop. So eventually, because we needed more time to complete the, the lettering, Lyubov was doing other stuff. And eventually the project became even more of a Madison landmark because it had yeah. the word Madison. It has two flags. So it was like it was growing during the process. Yeah, the the flag on the rooftop was a was a surprise to me when I saw that on his Instagram. I was like, I didn't know he was doing that. <laughs> that was really cool. Kind of, kind of hidden. No one can see it, but if you have like a drone, and or, or if you see on social right. media, it's like a e Easter egg. In there. Exactly. It, have you had you done a mural before? Had you worked on a project like this in the past? Um, not as hands on as this one. I I was involved with two other murals here in Madison, and, and this is what got me interested in, in, in doing this mural as well. Okay. The, the first mural was at uh, Willy Street. There's a mural called Try a Little Tenderness. It mm -hmm. is a, an homage to Oates Redding. Yeah. So the, the, the whole thing about that first mural is that I had two friends wanting to come to Wisconsin to visit the Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum. Okay. And I was like, if you have a chance to come, please stay in Madison, stay here for a week, let's do stuff in here. And then we go together to that um, conference, the Waste Goose Conference in the beginning of November. So as we were exchanging ideas in, in about when they could come here and et cetera, I just just told them, would you like to do a mural here in Madison? Because they have done murals before with their collective group called Creatipo, the artist group. Okay. And they were, and they told me, well, if you can get us the wall and the paint, we'll do it. And I was like, challenge accepted. <laughs> and then, and then I had like 40 days to figure things out. So I, I reached out to the city. I, 
I, I, I, I was looking for someone to, to talk to and they told me, you got to talk to Karen Wolf. Karen Wolf is the person and, uh, and she was uh, of great help because she helped me cut through all the red tape. She pointed me to a grant and she uh, drove me around to look for walls. So it was like we managed to make that happen because I was like, my friends are coming on the first week of November. If we can get this ready they would paint a mural and and then it worked and then i i told them about doing an homage to old shredding which i'm a big fan and i didn't know he died here in madison until oh I you got didn't here. okay no, because, I, mean, I was a fan but I, I never researched his history and then once i got here i was just walking at monona terrace and i stumbled upon the plate mm -hmm. and i was like oh so he died here so i always felt like there should be some a uh, more uplifting connection with him in town. And then my friends were on board to to pay this homage to him through the mural. We talked about Try a Little Tenderness. So ultimately that mural was, was designed by uh, Jacques so and Sila Costa, my friends. And I was uh, more like producing the mural and documenting the process. I make I made a making of video that is online showing the the process mm -hmm. of the mural during that week, and it, it was an amazing experience. And I got to know so many great people because of that project, and that led me to the second one, which is the the uh, Better Together mural in the Madison Mural Alley behind the Halter Library. Yeah. And for that mural, I invited two other friends. I always find a great thing, uh, like a great excuse to, to invite friends to do art stuff. So I invited two other Brazilian friends, um, Flavia Zimbardi and Caetano Calomino. They were living in Brooklyn at the time. And they came here to do that big mural. And it was also um, an amazing experience, especially because we had uh, we had some uh, a, a really frustrating issue with the mural, which was they got here on a Wednesday and they decided to go straight to the site and start tracing the letters. It had okay. this letter together, huge lettering. And Caetano was tracing with chalk. Uh, the letters using levels and rulers, paper rulers, and yeah. Flavia was just telling him the measurements. Like, you go 30 in here, 60 up there, and he was, like, measuring. Between Wednesday and Thursday morning, he had traced, like, 95% of the mural. He was, like, and we had painted the wall first and etc. So he was, like, ready to go. We went to lunch. It was amazing. And, like, afternoon, okay, let's start, finish the tracing and start painting. And then a tropical thunderstorm oh, it washed away everything oh no like we, we, yeah we like it was raining and raining when we come outside it was gone we were like no way and then i mean i knew we, you were gonna say that but i was hoping it was gonna be something else <laughs> nothing like it was, oh. it was raining horizontally to the wall and then it washed away everything mm. like two days of work of tracing and then we learned from that, and then the next day we were like tracing, painting, tracing, painting. Like, it didn't wait <laughs> long to, to start painting, but like it was, it was such a challenge. But but ultimately, it was it was a fantastic solution, and I'm I'm really proud of that Madison Mural Alley to see the work of different artists in one place. It revigorated the 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 area so much yeah so it's like it is beautiful and that's that area that's behind the uh it it's off of east washington avenue between east washington and milwaukee street is that the area i think i think so it is it is closer to milwaukee street it is behind the hawthorne library yeah across from where ellis Daly used to be right yep yep that's the area yeah i've gone by there and I, i've always wondered how that got started i've seen it it just popped up one day and I never knew the background of it. And I didn't know yeah, that you were that involved was, in that. that was like, uh, it started with the city and the bubbler yeah. uh, from, from the library. They, they were the ones uh, uh, at, at, at the head of the, of the project. And they invited the artist to, to be part of the, of the mural. I love the fact that most people, when they have uh, friends come into town, will post a recommendations thing on Facebook and go like, hey, where can I take some friends that are coming into town that really shows the city? You went, hey, let's make a mural. And I think <laughs> I like that, that that's where your mind went. Like I never would have thought to do that. Like more of a productive. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it was just interesting to hear you said you had some friends coming in and you were like, Hey, let's make a mural. Yeah. <laughs> I'm super glad that you did. That's really cool. <laughs> yeah.
Hey, I just wanted to take a break from the show to tell you about my website, TomRay'sWebsite.com. So if you go there, not only is that where the podcast is located, but I also do a daily autobiographical webcomic and I have a vlog that I do now where I talk about how I've started my own business. It's about basically going through my day. A lot of it is I sell pop culture items that I collect. It's one of my obsessions and I just decided what if I really dug into it went out, collected more, and then actually turned that into something that I could flip so I can continue selling them, so I can continue getting them. The place that I sell them is right on the website, TomRay'sWebsite.com. And if you go to the top or into the sidebar, there's a link to my eBay store. And you can go and check out all the stuff that I have. That was all I wanted to say. Visit TomRay'sWebsite.com and help support the show. What type of other stuff do you do? Like when you're teaching, like do you put out other work or uh, what stuff do you create aside from teaching and making murals? What are some of the things you like to do? Um, I'm involved with the uh, typography consultancy, for example. Recently, I've been working with the this uh, book here. I was going to ask you about that. I saw region. Cause you also yeah. seem to, you, you seem to have, uh, you've also posted some live video you've recorded of bad religion. You seem to be a fan of bad religion. I'm a huge fan of bad religion. I kind of got the that. Video, the video I shared was from the, from when they played here, like across from where I live at the Sylvie. Yeah. And I was like, man, I, I was just crossing the street and going to see my favorite band. That was, that was really an awesome experience. And the thing about the book is that they, they published the, their biography, the 40 years uh, mm -hmm. biography. And I ha a friend of mine invited me to help with the, tr the Portuguese uh, translation, the Brazilian version. No way. Yeah, yeah. How so did that did, happen? Well, he, he is, he's been publishing books from, from other bands. He's known for touring with those bands uh, oh. in the U.S., but also inviting those bands to play gigs in Brazil. So, And, and he has merchandise of those bands, like official merchandise mm -hmm. as well. He's been doing that for like, I don't know, two decades. Wow. And uh, so so he got this, he got the book and he was like, with the translation and the revision of the book, he's like, yes, definitely. And then as we were involved with the team, I was like, I can help you improve the typography, go for like things like the, the spacing, the alignments and uh, working with small caps and, and choosing a better typeface to save space, to save, uh, to make the book less expensive, that kind of thing. So that, that was a, a really interesting uh, project and it's, it's almost done. Like we are, we are this close to, to finish the, the Brazilian edition of, of the book. Wow. That's really so this cool. Is, this is one thing. And, uh, but aside from that, I were uh, essentially, I'm, I'm pretty much involved with the, um, uh, the educational field by teaching and, and working with the students. Aside from that, I would go for personal projects in, in uh, graphic design or typography. For example, I had posters I printed at the Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum. I, can, I think I got one in here. Well, not for people on the podcast, but that right. one printed in here. That one was from the... Um, the A Type I conference that I hosted, uh, I helped host in in Brazil a couple of years ago, and uh, so yeah, I, I try to get be involved with things that are print related, type related somehow, whether those are big murals or uh, poster printing or graphic design projects for like creating logos or visual identities is always something that interests me. Okay, and do you, do you do a lot of? Uh, would you say you do more digital printing, or do you do a lot of? different types of, I, I guess, analog printing. Uh, I, I guess I don't know what I would call it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. And I, I definitely prefer working with a metal type and wood type whenever I have a chance rather than digital printing. Of course, in digital printing, like working in the in the visual identity of, um, of an event, for example, this is uh, extremely rewarding, but working with the actual uh, wood type and or metal type, I think is a totally a different experience and even more rewarding because you get you get to spend a lot of time preparing the layout hands on like spacing out the letters and and testing out the inks and 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 making decisions on the spot based on the right. the the answer that you got from applying a particular ink or working with a particular layout so it is a richer experience 
that I really enjoy. Yeah. When you do that type of stuff, where do you do it at? Do you have a uh, studio that you go to or a place that you use? I wish I had. So I, I back in back in São Paulo when I when I lived in São Paulo, I used to do that at uh, Oficina Tipográfica São Paulo, which is a it's an amazing print shop that is hosted within um, a school, and and they have uh, they have a lot of uh, metal type and machinery to to print out that stuff. Here in Madison, I got to print twice. At the at the Hamilton Wood Type and Printing Museum when I had nice. a break, like winter break or something. Uh, but other than that, I'm always looking. Oh, I also printed at the university at UW once with uh, with a former student. We did like a, a a piece in there as well. But like I'm always looking for those opportunities. But it's been a while since last time I I printed something like with wood type or metal type. Like print uh, digital stuff, you can always do that. At the at any any printer with your computer and stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean that's that's why I asked too. And I know that you said uh, growing up, you know your your father's print sh- shop and stuff like that. So I knew you had the background. And I'm like, how much are you still able to do that way? So I was curious. And when you do it at the university, do they have that set up in? I know when we first met briefly and talked about how you worked at the UW. You said you worked in that big building that looks like it's like yeah it's like a a futuristic building from like a 1970s sci-fi movie Uh, (laughs) that the humanities you said it is right yeah okay is that where the print shop is or is there another place where that is is there is a print shop at the sixth floor in the in the apartment they have a a letterpress uh, print shop for the students so uh, i think i mean i I don't teach a letterpress there but like this is a this is a place where uh, students get to 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 print out stuff and to do book binding, and it's uh, they have like a their own collection of type in there. Okay. So yeah, what's one of the most difficult things about being a a, a printmaker or typography person? Like, what are some of the the troubles that you have trying to make that? Like working on setting these fonts and everything. I don't know. I just, I find it so strange when I look at it. I'm like, it seems like it looks right. I, I, mm-hmm. I, I'm just fascinated by, again, going into the whole like kerning and everything like that. Like, w- what is it about looking at it that you go, that needs to be fixed or, or th- this needs to be that way? I don't know. Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> it's, yes, yes, I okay. do. I do. I think, I mean, this is just something that is, um, when, when you're, when you're looking at letters, usually you're, you're trying to, look for consistency throughout the the layout and also for a balance in terms of the spacing so like you're constantly looking at the negative space of the composition like the space within letters in between letters in between lines in between columns the gutter and etc and we try to find a a balance in the arrangement of those elements whenever you're you're working with type and at times if you're working with a typeface that has uh, a character that is not so properly designed, it stands out when you're when you're doing a text and it's like, oh, that character is just it doesn't it doesn't feel like it belongs to that family. Okay. Like it feels like an odd uh, element. So I, I think this is the thing. Like we are constantly looking at the shapes the shapes of the letters and trying to improve on that. Uh, either through type design or by working with uh, the layout of those uh, characters on any given um, project. I, I don't think there is something like, oh, this is the hardest thing. Eventually, like, of course, if you're working, let's say, with web fonts, mm-hmm. uh, I, I believe that that is um, a situation that is still finding its own way over the, the past decade, for example, because it's quite recent that people are, working with more web fonts other than the ones that were bundled in the operating soft uh, operating systems so right now let's say i'm developing a website i and i'm working with web fonts i need to be concerned about what that font is going to look like how that font is going to be rendered in uh, in different uh, browsers in different operating systems mm-hmm. and it will look quite different so like not only the kerning but you will look into the hinting which is like how the pixels will be turned on and off based on the the instructions that come with the typeface so i i think is more of a, a a trickier situation working with type online getting back to the conversation that i said before when i was working with a graphic designer who was designing a website that i was creating 
that is one of the conversations I have the most is that putting something on a poster, putting something on a print, you can perfectly lay out what is worded there, how it's laid out and everything. And with a website, a website is going to be this size. It's going to be this size. It's going to have, it's going to, the, the uh, words that are put on it are going to change daily. And there is going to be, depending on the size, that one word that does wrap around underneath because you can't decide like, and I would have, they, uh, there were many conversations I would have where they're like, oh, that word is trailing underneath. You need to fix that. And I'm like, that's, that's the, that could be that way any day. Like somebody could add one extra word to something and that's, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's the, that's the interesting thing about type and web. And that's why it fascinates me because I do get, like when I see the kerning fixed, I'm like, okay, I see what you're talking about now. But then they're using the different styles. There's mixing styles. There's all kinds of stuff. Like it, it, fonts can actually be artwork. Like behind you, there's stuff where it's less drawing than it is fonts or typography. Yeah. And, it, and it's not only uh, on websites, but also on eBooks. Like you oh, get yeah. to choose the size, the font size for reading on eBooks. And, and once you change the font size, it changes the number of pages. It changes the whole layout. So it is this fluid uh, layout that is that is like the new frontier sort of saying, although it's been around for for a couple of years. But not only that, there is also something quite interesting that is um, possible because of uh, the this digital environment, which is people releasing typefaces that are in development. Mm -hmm. So like they can put typefaces for sale that are ongoing. So like this is this is something that is quite new, oh, and yeah. uh, so it's like let's say I'm working on a typeface for example, and this is something that can take months or years to be ready. And if I'm not getting paid for that, it, 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 take, it, it, is, it makes it harder. So what people do these days are like they would release a earlier version of that phone that is not complete yet, but it's like a promise. And they are selling that for a small amount of, uh, pro, uh, uh, for a small amount. Once they update that font, they would increase the price, but if you paid for that font early on, you get all the following updates for free. So, like, this is one way for, like, if you bet on my project right now, I'll, I will give you all the updates in the future for free. And and this is, like, a, this is a, a thing. Like, you can have fonts available online that are officially incomplete mm -hmm. because, of like, I'm, I'm still working on it, but if you want to use it, you, you can go ahead. These are the things that are done, and these are the things that need improvement, just so you know, so you can you can prepare yourself to, to take advantage of that. Yeah, because it's the internet, and you can, I mean, stuff can change any time, and you can fix yeah. it and change it and put it in different places and go like, okay, that's that version. Here's this version if you want it. it oh, my God. I just realized that's what Kanye does. He he will really he'll get an idea for a song and he'll just release that like an unfinished version of a song, put it on his SoundCloud. People will comment on it and then he'll all of a sudden just delete it and then create. And see how they react? Yeah. And, uh... I mean, I hate to make a Kanye reference because that's such a strange comparison, but he does do that. But when he's done that, I've been like, that's genius because it's the internet. Like, who cares? Just post some stuff and see what you because that's the other thing. Putting it on the internet. You can sit there and, or at least me personally, I've I've worked on stuff and I'm like, I think that's cool. I don't know. And then sometimes if you just put it online, all of a sudden you're putting it in front of people and you're viewing it like you know people are viewing it and you have a whole different perspective on what you're working on because you know that it's being seen as opposed to, I can't show this yet because it's not ready. And I've done that sometimes just to go, oh, let's see if that, this makes me uncomfortable in a good or bad way. Because of course it's going to make me uncomfortable. You're putting stuff out there. That's that you made such a oh my god. That's I never that didn't occur to me. And it's so like right there. Funny. And you get people's reaction like on yeah. the fly, and that is really helpful for sure. And the other thing too, when you were talking about eBooks, there's the whole concept of there are fonts that are readable, like you know, easy to read. You know, yeah. it like uh, it, something. The only way I can actually put it into words is kind of like they're harsh or they're less harsh on the eyes because they're easy to read in different lighting. I don't know. Is that, is that a thing or am I just making that up? <laughs> no, no, that, that is, that is the thing. Like you, you have uh, fonts that were, that are designed 
to be uh, easy to read against a dark background, for example. Like when you switch on the EPUB, like if you mm. want your ebook to have a dark background so you don't have a lot of light being thrown at your face, you can make subtle adjustments on the thickness of that uh, typeface so that it will render better in the in, with a dark background, for example. So yeah, that, that is a thing. Yeah, and now I, it, that occurred, it occurred to me while you were saying that too, there's also the fact that... Uh, people can adjust how large their fonts are going to be on their screens these days too. So you got to factor that in as well. Or, or even changing the font altogether. Like you, you, you <laughs> came up with a design for a particular book and they were like, no, no, I want to read with this font because this is the font that I'm more used to. And I feel comfortable reading with this particular font. So people will start having font preferences and it doesn't matter what your design is, if it's online, if it's a website or if it's an ebook, they would just change the font Wow! if they want to. Are, are you going to be releasing the, or are they going to be releasing the Bad Religion book on an ebook? Uh, yes, yes, the, it, it is already on ebook the the U.S. version, but uh, I'm not sure about the the Brazilian version. I gotta ask uh, Highlight Sounds about it, but uh, it, it is already on e, on ebook the the U.S. version. Wow. Okay. Still, I I still think that's really cool that you got to do that, and also the yeah, fact that it's only, one of your but favorites. Only, but only on the Brazilian version, not the U.S. Just I know, so. but still. Come on. Yeah. It cool, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then uh, do you have anything else that you're working on or something you'd like to mention or upcoming projects or anything at all that you'd like to talk about or mention before we finish up here today? I am I am so swamped with the, with the online classes that this is the only thing that I have in front of me right now, but I, I would say yeah, I think I'm going to I'm going to close with that because I'm all surrounded by books and magazines and like adapting content for the for the online classes that's all i can think about how is that going <laughs> is this is this the foreseeable future like are you doing the rest of the year as teaching on online classes well most likely there there are some i mean i do i, I would love to meet students especially because in graphic design and publication design classes it is important for students to print out uh, so that they can see how legible the layout is or the contrast and uh, and testing out different fonts for example but i don't think i mean i've got to wait until see what is going to happen in the upcoming weeks if if things go sour completely we'll have to be 100 percent online and and adapt to it but like uh, but i'm preparing for for both situations okay. either if we have to go completely online for the whole fall or if we are, if we have a chance in October, perhaps to to meet them eventually, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah, sounds good. Then. Yeah, I know. I would have preferred to be able to sit with you and and look at the work that you have on your wall instead of seeing yeah. it on the screen. But hey, this works too. You know, at least we got to yeah. talk. I'm glad we did. And where can people go and check out your stuff? You want to name some of the? You have a website or uh, Instagram or anything you'd like people to check you out? You can. I have a new Instagram because of the murals where I want to share stuff about uh, uh, type that are type related uh, and related to typocracia. The handle in Instagram is typocracia underscore. So T I P O C R A C I A underscore. But I also have, uh, you will find me on Behance. I have some uh, work published on Behance, like graphic design stuff, type related things I did, visual identities, posters, and et cetera. You, you will find stuff in there as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm really glad that we got a chance to finally sit down and, and meet proper. <laughs> yeah, Ton, and thank you for having me. I'm a, I'm a great fan of the, of the podcast. 